Um, we're talking about the systems and like this. Um, so in general, and there's a sort of simplified view of the file systems and performance is at the you generally down the bottom, at least on this main structure here. Uh, and so there's various tiers of storage which you can use. Uh, so yes, keeping things in memory, and actually it's perhaps worth knowing that there is a, a RAM disk file system mounted at slash temp on compute nodes on Cori. So you can actually put files directly into memory, although that obviously takes out some of your application's memory. But next in performance to that is uh, the burst buffer, which you've heard about quite a few times today, uh, which is an SSD file system. Uh, and then Scratch, and I'm sure all of these, so I won't dwell on them. Um, but basically, we've got Scratch, Community, which is more a project file system, and then HSS, which is a tape um, storage. Uh, and then sort of on the side of this is something that we've optimized for story, uh, software. Uh, called common, and uh, then people's home directories. Um, so just to go through the, the, the most one that you encounter the most if you're running jobs on Cori is Cori Scratch. Uh, so this is a Lustre-based file system, which is one of the most uh, you know, mature HP, uh, HPC file systems. Uh, you know, one of the most important things that's already been mentioned about this is that files that are not in 12 weeks are automatically deleted. So if you are using things intensely, they won't be deleted. But if you leave things around for weeks, they will be cleared up. Um, and so this is this sort of schematic of uh, what uh, the Scratch files are basically uh, uh, an IO network which connects lots of storage servers. So um, you can use various tools in Quincy Wood to write files across, striped across multiple um, of these servers. But really, that's where a lot of the bandwidth performance comes from, is spreading things across servers. So just one thing to tell you in order to do that is to control the striping. So actually, we see that a lot of files are quite small. Uh, and so by default, we just have things stored on one OST, which makes sense for such small files. Uh, however, if you're using larger files and you're also using this kind of uh, MPI shared file, for example, uh, then you want to strike across multiple servers. Uh, and one way to do that is these helper scripts that we provide that just give sort of optimum options. Uh, based on so here's a little table of the, the possible sizes. And so for, if you're between 10 and 100 gigabytes, for example, you can use this Stripe Media helper script. If you're feeling more expert, then you can actually set things using this LF, uh, LFS get stripe and LFS uh, to do that. Okay, uh, so then I'll talk a lot more about the burst buffer. This has been mentioned quite a few times already. Today. It's uh, provided by Cray, a way of accelerating IO uh, that stores things on um, SSD based file system, but also these file systems uh, on the fly for jobs. So this means it isn't a huge shared file system, and so it doesn't have all the metadata contention with others. Uh, so this can lead to more consistent performance and also better performance, both for uh, high I.O. bandwidth applications and also out sort of metadata limited applications. Uh, but it's nothing that clever. I mean, well, it's clever in its back end, but once it's presented, it's not difficult to use because it file system that you can use as, as you would scratch or anything like that. Uh, so this sort of shows the, the architecture of this, that our nodes for Lustre that talk to a file system, the burst buffer nodes have directly mounted SSDs on them. Uh, but these can be seen by uh, computers, essentially. Uh, so here's an example of how to use it. So as I, I briefly mentioned, you use uh, Slurm directives to control this. A Slurm batch script, you have these uh, S batch commands that you've seen earlier. Uh, and then to control the burst buffer, you add a pound DW command. Um, so the first of these is uh, this job DW, which uh, means that this um, allocation will only be for this particular not persistent across jobs. And there is an option for that that I'll come to next. Um, it's striped, so all the compute nodes will see. Uh, of the space. 
uh, there is a private mode which where a compute node only can see its own space, which is a bit more local disk analog. But in this one, all the compute nodes can see all the disk. Uh, the actual amount that the the data is the, the number of servers that it's striped across is is actually only controlled by the size. So not like Lustre where you can set individual striping. Uh, and this is done in units of granularity, which we had system setting at 20 gigabytes. So if you request uh, 100 gigabytes, for example, you would be striped across five nodes. So it's actually useful if you want like performance and better streaming performance to um, to request uh, at least 100 gigabytes to stripe across. Um, you know, a few. Uh, then the system also provides these commands to easily stage in data from scratch and out again. One little quirk is it doesn't environment variable here, so you provide the full path. Uh, but then you can stage in files or directories. Uh, and this occurs outside your job, They're not paying for this data transfer time. And it also uh, occurs actually quite fast. It's quite a performance stage in and stage out. But if you prefer, you can actually just, as I mentioned, and so you can just copy things in and out inside your job. Um, then there's also, uh, so then what we're starting, this uh, DW job striped is an easy way to find the mount point. So it's actually mounted on some obscure path, uh, but this environment points to it. And here, so you can see this executable, uh, this assumes that your executable actually takes this kind of argument. It doesn't add this kind of argument magic executable but uh, it just shows that you can then use this path instead of what you would previously use on Lustre. Uh, but as well as running, you can also use it interactively. So this is an example of using the interactive queue here, and you can add this dash dash BBF flag where you put the um, uh, directives that you had inside this file, and then it will actually do that and set that up for you for the interactive job. Uh, okay. And then uh, I mentioned you can also use a persistent reservation. So this is kind of useful actually, even if you don't need it across multiple jobs. In the previous example, it will actually tear down and just like, remove all the data after the job is finished. So if you made a mistake and left some data on there to get it otherwise. Um, so you can use this persistent reservation to keep it alive for several jobs and even to share it with different users in your project, uh, in which you use Unix file permissions for. But don't forget to delete this when it's not needed. And we don't guarantee that things will be available for a long time. In particular, the data warp storage is designed for performance. So it's very highly striped and stuff, and it's not resilient. So occasionally, both purpose servers fail. And don't keep the data on there, because it will be unavailable if that happens. So you can always just stage out what you need uh, at the end of any job. Um, create you also need to use a, a Slurm directive to do that. So you need to submit a short job to create it and similarly to delete it. Uh, the resident outside just to make sure that it's been shut up with this S control show burst command that shows examples like this. And here's the name. Um, is, <laughs> it isn't the same as this one, but yeah, it shows the name of something that you have. Uh, and then to use it in a job, you use these kind of commands. So note that there's actually a pound BB and then a pound DW here. Uh, and then you can do things like stage in and so forth and run. Okay, um, so then, um, so that's the burst buffer. So sort of very temporary file system as I've been. On the, the, for things that you really wanna keep around for a much longer time, you want to use the community file system. So this is particularly useful for large data sets for a longer period, for multiple years, potentially. Uh, you can set it, it's set up for sharing, group, read permissions are default, but it's not really meant for intensive. So if you're really, um, you know, if you're hammering the file system, you should use Scratch instead and then maybe migrate the data you want to keep over to community. Uh, and easily share data externally. Uh, just there, there is a, you can create a www directory within your um, uh, community, uh, pro, you know, project directory, uh, and then put your username there and it will appear as sort of a web address. Um, data on here is never, you know, purged by us, uh, or at least not, not regularly. If your project after a certain period, it will, it will be removed, but you, you can, you know, you can manage that. 
Uh, it's snapshotted, so there's backups for it if, you, if something goes wrong. And uh, you can manage your own usage of uh, the whole project is managed by quotas. Space allocate between multiple directories and give uh, different groups that use these different quotas. Uh, and I'll show an example of that if I have time in a little demo. Um, okay, and there's more documentation here. And as someone mentioned earlier in one of the questions, there's this environment variable, but it points to this top level directory because you can have multiple spaces here. So you need to add the, the specific one you want under there. Okay, so then HPSS is thing you want to keep like sort of forever maybe or or for a very long term or or things that are much rather larger capacity so you can't really keep them on CFS or scratch uh, but it is tape so it can be very slow to access now actually it's a spinning dish cache for performance so you might find that if you retrieve something that you retrieved recently uh, it will actually be quicker than, than time later where it's a huge delay um, and you you might have multiple files that you um, that are all very small and very good to those as they are so you can use this htar for example to aggregate this into bundles uh, and this comment about archive the way you intend to retrieve it um, you know you want to split it up according to how you might want to pull it back because it's a bit of a cost to to do so then a uh, sort of different file system on the side is this software file system, global comment. And, and why is this that we have this? We saw a lot of variation in library load performance on different uh, file systems that we have. And so we created this as something that's, that's sort of optimized for lots of libraries. Um, so while it's writable on the login nodes, it's actually read only from a compute node. Uh, and so you here, yeah, it's got a smaller quota than community file system, uh, but then it's optimized with a smaller block size for faster compiles than project. And again, you can keep this long term. Okay, so then lastly, and probably something that everyone will touch is their home. And so, you know, you have a, a decent 20 gig quota here, but we don't really expand that. So um, you want to use other file systems and also for storing large data sets. Um, but this is backed up and also has snapshots. So for example, at this path, you can have something you had the day before and accidentally deleted. Okay, so that's just the overall picture again. So I think you probably have that. Uh, and then I just have a couple of demos. So I don't know if I've got time. I think I have a time. Uh, yeah, you've got about five minutes. Okay, so first data dashboard. So I'll just go quickly to that. So this is in my NERSC. Um, so you might have seen this already. You log in here and the first page you see is this dashboard and you can already see something of your quotas here, but you can see a lot more if you go to this data dashboard page. Yours will not be as big as mine. Mine probably takes a moment to load and starts my fans going. Um, but um, so then here you can see how much of the space is used. Uh, and then you can also see who are the big users. So if you find someone in your project who's using it all up, you can easily shout at them from here. And then you can also clean up yourself with this thing, which shows you very easily, oh, I'm using this one file is taking up 250 gigabytes, for example. So here I'm sort of naming and shaming myself, actually, <laughs> showing all my own usage. Uh, and then it has even this nicer, uh, actually, maybe zoom. My computer can't handle zoom and this. <laughs> so, but, uh, but this has a very nice way of visualizing um, the data that you have. And so you can see that this SC19 directory I have here is buying quite data and you can see the individual files within that. Okay, so that was that demo. And then I'll quickly move to the other one, which is in Iris. So you've already been shown how to log into Iris. So in Iris, you can um, you know, search for your projects up here. And you will see so, and then there's, a, oops, I was actually on the right tab before, the storage tab. Uh, and this shows all the direct have on CFS in this project. And then you can see the individual storage used by by all of them uh, and you can 
on here and you can edit if you're a PI or PI proxy of the, of the project, um, how much space is allocated to this project. Uh, and then who's allowed to access this project is controlled by the group that you can also uh, edit. Okay, so that was my demos. And I think I'm pretty much done. So really, just if people have any questions. Okay, um, thanks, Wahid. Yeah, we have uh, a few questions. So um, oh, okay. can, you, can you define striping again in, in kind of a general sense what that means? Uh, it's, it's just um, spreading the data, uh, well, spreading the data across multiple servers. Uh, and in this case, it's individual blocks of the file. A large file can be held on multiple servers by striping it. I think that's a good enough answer. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. another, another question is, um, would you want uh, striping, for example, uh, in image processing or for image files? Um, yeah, I mean, it, again, it depends how you're accessing the data so if and, and how big the files are. So um, potentially, if there were large files and your application was set up to be able to write, you know, uh, to read and write them from multiple servers. I mean, Quincy is probably actually a better person who will talk more in detail about Rubio in a couple of talks time. Okay, and then our last question, I see Shane is answering, but this person is wondering, is there anything you can do to try to put a file in the lowest level cache um, so that it's um, quickly accessible? Um, so, well, I mean, so there's, there's this whole hierarchy. So in a way, the SSD buffer is a kind of cache. Um, so there's that. Then also like accessing from the Luster file system, Luster has a file caching memory. And so as you read the file, it will, it will cache recently accessed parts in memory as well. So I don't know if that, that answers a bit of the question. Actually, there is an, also another approach with Shifter that maybe Shane will mention in his talk, um, which, can, which can also greatly improve um, you know, have very heavy data, mass data. Okay, yeah, this person's asking, for example, like, is there, if they have a one terabyte file, um, uh -huh. that won't fit in local memory. So is there some strategy for handling that? Ooh. Uh, well, you can put it on the burst buffer, which at least will get you the best performance you can. Um, yeah, again, I don't know. I mean, Quincy might also have a few tips on that, but yeah. Yes, yeah, so it also depends on your, um, your application and so forth. I mean, certain applications support read ahead and so which can bring it into memory as you are. Okay, well, thank you very much, Wahid.